Without further ado, Mr. Richard Green uh, will be talking about how Island is changing that space in the enterprise browser world. Thank you very much. Is this for me? Is this for me? Hello, hello, hello. So normally it's me keeping you away from the bar. You're keeping me away from the bar. I do not have a drink in my hand, and I hear there's a good gin and tonic out there. So thank you, Ed. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm Richard Green. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I want to talk to you about a new and exciting space, which, is, which Ireland is leading. It's called the Enterprise Browser. And if you remember, in 2020, we had two key trends that accelerated very fast on us. One is we all went home to work, and two, we put our applications in the cloud. So why was that a problem? Well, we were very network-centric in the view of life, and now we, are very, we need to be browser-centric. So can you imagine trying to govern the browser in a way that gave a user a better experience? that reduced your risk and extracted cost out of your infrastructure. So uh, that's what we in anticipate doing with the enterprise browser. And we'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we think about work and how we think about security. So with that, let's introduce Island. So as, as the introduction said, we're a bunch of guys who've been around for at least 30 years doing this. We've been at Bluecoat, Symantec, McAfee, and a series of other companies. <coughs> This attracted some very large VC firms, and it attracted not only the VC firms, but their managing directors. And during this time, over the last two years, we've been deploying over two million enterprises to some of the largest, most respected companies in the world. Uh, and they're in pretty much every major sector. And when I looked at the audience today here, you're from finance, healthcare, BPO, manufacturing, legal, retail, all of these are using, all these companies are using a browser technology today. This then caught the attention of Gartner. Now, you know, Gartner's a great purview for our industry. They wrote a 20-page document on the future of enterprise browsing. And I guess you all read it. Yes? No? No. I didn't think so. So let me summarize it in one slide for you. So, in, it's, it's Gartner's belief that by 2031, enterprise browsers will grow to become platforms by which security and productivity software is delivered. And it's consumed by the workforce on both managed and unmanaged devices, creating a seamless work experience between home and work, which ultimately is what we've all been trying to do. So I think this is the goal of the enterprise browser. So how did this application come to be the focus of attention? We know that the browsers are the application that enterprises use the most, but trust the least. Why? Because they were built by advertisers for consumers, not for enterprises and their constituents. And what we've done is treated this like a caged animal. We surround it with agents, proxies, gateways, a slew of other security controls, just to get it to enact the policies that we want. And because of that, our infrastructure is more complex than it needs to be. The costs get out of hand, and the user experience can be frustrating. So let's talk about that user experience, because that's what we have to deal with every day. Because we surround users with the controls that we want, you end up with two types of users. You get the user who has a sense of privacy and doesn't enjoy being watched by big brother. So what do they do? VPNs, encrypted email, other proxies, anything to create a shadow IT environment around your controls. Or they're a very productive worker, they want to work harder, so they create a little cloud storage so they can put work in there so they can use it at home or at work. A little bit of a DLP challenge. So the point here is that the, we're trying to get to the point where um, we can embrace both of those, those constituents and make them better. So with that said, what we're trying to do here is the user themselves, we sat down with an analyst who said, Users who suffer from poor experience will they try to avoid and evade the controls that you have. So whether they do that directly or inadvertently. So what we're saying is the enterprise browser can be your security team and help your security team enable your business and make your users more productive. So it's really the center of work. And so at this point, we need to sort of stop behaving and treating it the way we're treating it and make it the most trusted application that we're using. That's the mission that we have here at Apple. So let's look at what is this thing, how's it built, what's it made of. So we took the Chrome Open Source project that represents 95% of the major browsers out there, Chrome, Edge, Brave, all use that. We 
we use the same code because it gets the, the user the same experience, they can take the same uh, the, uh, whatever UI, UX you've got, whatever tabs in there, all of your uh, bookmarks, etc. move over. Which means you don't have to retrain your users, they're going to be essentially know how to use this. And so the other part about using Chromium is it's already been tested by billions of users, so the interoperability of it is, is known, the rendering of it is known. So it works on Chrome and it works on Edge, it'll work on it. So if we take that element and then we just naturally embed enterprise controls within that system, we end up with the enterprise browser. So it becomes a workspace where work just flows beautifully whilst being remaining fundamentally secure. So I'm going to just blow you over the bit of architecture, not something you necessarily want to see at 4 30 in the afternoon with a gin and tonic in your hand. However, it explains how this is built. It's really what they call a super app. The last super app we all use is a thing called a smartphone. It used to make phone calls. Now it does pretty much everything else in your life in that one device. And the same idea applies here. So items are composed of many different modules, which are used to replace or improve the enterprise security stack in both managed and unmanaged devices. And we can do this because we're sitting in a position where we're pre-SSL, so we're not encrypted and we're actually building inside the browser. This gives us huge advantages to do things that you couldn't otherwise do. And so, at a big picture level, we can install as a browser or an extension, and we're essentially your central enforcement policy control point at the browser. So this then allows us to build sort of four, five work streams. The first one being security. Clearly we've got anti-malware, anti-phishing, we can do everything from device posture to being self-protected so that you can then write policies and controls over what you see on the internet. Moving into data protection, um, from a data protection point of view, you can, you, you've got DLP that we can provide or we can use the DLP you've got. I did a little video for this talk a couple of weeks ago. I'm talking about extending DLP. The essence of what this browser is doing is ensuring that you your persona accurately gets into your environment so you get to the applications you've given the permission to get to. And so, during in those applications, data can move freely between any application product that is insured. But if you try to let that data escape outside, you now have the controls that limit that. So, so you are in control of that data. And you can extend your DLP branch. As we move into network and infrastructure, we've got device management. It's almost as good as MDM. We've got privileged access management, which is as good as a cyber app. And we have ZTMA considered for web, SSH, and RDP. As we move into IT and enterprise, you get things like a password manager. I know we see a few hacks on those, and this is within our control, and it's being received extremely well. The other thing that you have to do, you have got a customer that's got 650,000 users that are deploying in 90 countries, 40 brands, Personas. You need to be able to customize it really well and really easily. So that's what we can do there. And finally, there's the user's productivity themselves. We've given them the password manager. We also give them a clipboard so you can clip 50 copies if you like and have them more rapidly deployed when you paste them. And finally, we've got an AI assistant. I know everybody's got one of these, but the key is how do you control the question and how do you control the response? So we'll come on to that in the use cases. So let's just talk about some use cases. Let me start on the left-hand side. You see shared capabilities. This is really important. Everything we can do in the browser allows us to control the presentation layer to the user, their keyboard, their mouse, and their screen. This is the last part of control. So we can tell you how you know, if people have been something outside of that application boundary we mentioned, you need to control, cut, copy, paste, print, upload, download. If you're zooming and you've got sensitive information to somebody outside your organization, you should be able to control it. So those are all considered. The thing that kind of blew me away when I first saw, which is an addition to this, is, is a browser-based kind of robotic process automation which RPA. This allows you to not have to own your applications or know where the development teams are. You have the presentation there, and you say, well, I don't want to see any credit cards, because they're in scope for PCI. Just write a rule setting so redacted and credit card and just log it out. 
So it just blanks it out on the screen. It's actually still in the database, but it's not on the presentation. Mm -hmm. Same with PII. There are so many examples like that. If you wanted to add an extra MFA check on a particularly sensitive website, you don't want to have to go back to the developer to get them to write that. You just should be able to put that onto the presentation, which you can. You can eradicate buttons. There's a whole bunch of controls that you can see. So we're doing all of this work, but because we're, we can see everything that's going on, the other thing we're doing is we're just collecting the logs. And those logs show every keystroke, every script screen that is made. Solves two problems. One, if you're a DevOps and you're trying to make your applications better, smarter, more productive for people, you can see exactly how the users are interacting with that application. Same is true if you're trying to do root cause analysis in the SecOps team. You can now see every keystroke that was made and exactly what that user went up to. I don't, I don't think any of you have ever had that visibility before. I've never seen it. So um, those those features and capabilities then can go to the use cases. So the first use case we're talking about is critical SaaS app and internal web apps. That is that control boundary between public SaaS and internal app. We sort of discussed that. The second part is, which I also think is an incredibly hard problem to solve, which is unmanaged users. So you've got VPO who stop contractors, you've got lawyers who want to come into your environment, you want to invite them, and what would we do to them? We send them a laptop, we send them VPNs, we have a support team, we have an IT department. So we've got a customer who has in the pharmaceutical space, 600 interns a year. Imagine how much that costs to onboard into your infrastructure for eight weeks. The capital, the human, the whole effort. Now all they do is send them a link, they click on it, 20 seconds later the enterprise browser branded with the pharmaceuticals on their UIOD device. That it puts it into a single sign-on, whatever they're using, some SAML 2.0, and now they get to the applications they're allowed to get to. And when we finish, we switch off that capability. How much quicker, how much easier? Um, slightly moving to one side on the contract, this is this BYOD. We all want to use the device we want to use, but we don't want Big Brother looking at our privacy. And as Big Brother, we don't want to look at your privacy. We have no interest in knowing what you do in your own time. But in the workspace, we need to control it. So you can now say yes to BYOD, you can now say yes to, to personal genome, because you have the ability to control it. Moving slightly further afield with VDI, there's lots of it out there, it's a fantastic technology, it's very necessary, but as we move so many of our applications to the cloud, do we really need that anymore? That's a lot of infrastructure, it's a lot of cost. We're at one large bank where they have 300,000 people sitting on VDI and they're eradicating that and putting it in the island browser. They're saving hundreds of millions to do it. Now, how you deploy VDI, how you use it, your mileage will vary. But the point is, this is a way to reduce costs and simplify your infrastructure. Final use case is really what we all talk about in our industry is AI. It's not the AI that's important, it's the control of it. Because we're still trying to figure this thing out. One is we don't want to send proprietary information out to the large language box because we don't want them to have our data. At the same token, when the data comes back in, what do we know about that data? So we have a bank that knows its developers goes out, go out to use ChatGPT to write code. They write the code, we want to be able to inspect that on the way back in, we want to do source code analysis, we want to do vulnerability checks, we also want to do attribution. If that code's going to end up in my code library, I need to know where it came from. So all of those things are considered as use cases that are now possible because of this visibility on the endpoint. So let's talk about this in an actual customer use case. I like this story because I understand it. My survey says how many people bought a mattress in the last five years? And this is me, really. Apparently, that's how often we go into mattress stores. I don't think I've been in for one for 10 years, but my wife and I bought something during COVID before this happened. But Mattress Firm was trying to work out how they could create an Apple Store experience when you went into Mattress Firm. So they bought a bunch of Microsoft Surface tablets, and then they put an application with the EDI front end, which is Citrix. And they took them 50 seconds for the application to load up. Can you imagine what that selling experience must be like? So they did this parallel project with uh, Island, and the, the, the uh, uptick time was five times faster. So they ended up deploying this with seven and a half thousand Microsoft Surface tablets in 2,000 stores. We met them six weeks before Memorial Day weekend, which is their best selling weekend. We met them POC deployed in time for that weekend. They had the best record 
sales that weekend. They got sold to a PE company for four billion dollars about like five months later. I don't know whether that's to do with our rounds or not, but it's a good story. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll leave that. Uh, anyway, it just uh, you go into that store now and you watch the lottery round, and that's what they're using. They're using Ireland to give you a better customer experience. So sales are better, customers happier. You reduce your costs, but you kept your risk in check. So. There are about 124 of these stories, and the only place to kind of go and look and find out what they are is to go to Gartner's Peer Insights. 106 companies have already reviewed Ireland. 98% of them gave it a five-star rating, and you can find out who they are in terms of size, shape, and what the use cases were. If you'd like to, to get the, enterprise, the Gartner Enterprise Future Report, or you want to know how to get to this, please ask, and we'd be happy to give this information to you. So what we like to say, Island is sometimes changing 